Hello, everyone. My name is Kaylee Patton, and I am the Community Events Coordinator for the American Liver Foundation, Mid-America Division. I would like to thank you for joining today's online conversation. The American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease. We provide a voice for patients with liver disease and their families through education, support, research, and advocacy. I would like to thank Dr. Kamran Qureshi, who will be sharing his expertise and providing information to enhance your proficiency as a clinician, specifically in the field of gastroenterology and hepatology. Following today's presentation, I will send out an email with a link to the presentation recording and some information about our upcoming events. Without any further ado, I would now like to introduce our speaker for this presentation. Dr. Kamran Qureshi is an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at St. Louis University School of Medicine. Prior to this, he served as an assistant professor of medicine and hepatologist in the Division of Gastroenterology at Temple University in Philadelphia. He completed his hepatology training at Florida Hospital in Orlando and also worked there as a faculty hepatologist. Dr. Qureshi's clinical interests are the management of advanced liver disease and complications of liver cirrhosis, the care of patients with liver diseases before and after liver transplantation, viral hepatitis, and liver malignancies. Dr. Qureshi has authored and co-authored multiple research manuscripts in leading peer-reviewed journals and was involved in various funded clinical trials at previous institutions. He is a member of the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases, European Association for the Study of the Liver, American Gastroenterological Association, American College of Gastroenterology, and is a member of the American Liver Foundation, Mid-America Division's Medical Advisory Committee. Dr. Qureshi will now begin his presentation. All right, thank you uh, all for joining in the middle of your busy work day today. Uh, a big thanks to American Liver Foundation for arranging this educational series and giving me the opportunity to talk about the most uh, common primary liver cancer, which is hepatic cellular carcinoma. I am uh, Dr. Kamran Qureshi, assistant professor at St. Louis University Hospital. During the next 30 to uh, 45 minutes, I will touch upon these important concepts and uh, uh, clinical management tools in hepatic cellular carcinoma. We will talk about the uh, epidemiology of hepatic cellular carcinoma, um, strategies to reduce the increasing uh, uh, disease burden. We will talk about strategies of uh, clinical use in clinic in screening and surveillance of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And in the last, we'll talk about ma various methods of diagnosis and staging of HCC uh, to help us guide the management and care of these patients. So uh, let's start with epidemiology. Uh, this graph is a nice description of the collective data from World Health Organization regarding the global prevalence of uh, various cancers. So they collected the data and uh, if you see along the y-axis, uh, it depicts the incident rates, the diagnosis of new cancer, and liver cancer comes at number six. It ranks number six in terms of incident cancers, when on the x-axis uh, is the mortality rates from each cancer and liver cancer ranks fourth as the most uh, fourth most common cause of uh, cancer related death um, HCC is seen all over the world but has varying varying uh, global prevalence on average the prevalence ranges from more than 50 to 75 cases per 100,000 people in certain countries from Asia and Africa uh, and it is as seen as less than three cases per 100,000 people in other countries. Uh, this is mainly driven by the various risk factors for the development of HCC, um, which are uh, prevalent in certain parts of the world. 
as we can see, Mongolia, for example, has the world's highest incidence of uh, liver cancer with 78 cases diagnosed per year as new uh, cancer per 100,000 of the population there. Uh, it is eight times the global average. And there, the underlying risk factors are hepatitis B, hepatitis C infection, and alcohol consumption. Uh, just next to it, China also has very high prevalence of new diagnosis of CCC, and half of their cancers can be attributed to hepatitis B infection, which affects about 400 million people uh, globally. And in U.S., the uh, prevalence of hepatitis B surface antigen is about 9% in their population. As we move towards uh, Africa, um, there uh, we can see that the, the risk factors for HCC are a little different. Uh, dietary exposure to aflatoxin B1 is a major uh, cofactor in HCC development in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and as estimates about 60% of liver cancer cases there. Um, uh, the aflatoxin B1 amplifies the risk of red cellular carcinoma among the patients of hepatitis B infection through a specific mutation in DP53. This is seen in certain Asian and African region. A um, little bit more west in the Western countries and Japan, the main cause of hepatitis cellular carcinoma is hepatitis C infection. Uh, the more worrisome finding is that the incidence of fat cellular carcinoma due to fatty liver disease is increasing. It is noted that uh, incidence of HCC in the United States is rising along with the, the rising epidemic of NASH and obesity along with diabetes, which increases the risk of HCC. Um, alcohol cirrhosis is another important cause of hepatic cellular carcinoma. Uh, smoking and co-infection with HIV can also contribute to the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. And the same data is depicted slightly differently in this graph. Um, and this format gives us some numbers along with the most common etiologies of HCC globally. Um, so we can see the majority of hepatocellular carcinoma in the patients with underlying liver disease, mostly as a result of hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection or along and alcohol abuse. Globally, overall, hepatitis B is the most common cause of HCC, slightly higher than the alcohol and uh, followed by hepatitis C. Um, and the graph shows different etiologies in different color in the bars in, and divided into different regions, and we see that there is considerable variability in different regions in the world. If we focus on North, Afri North America, alcohol and related cirrhosis is the number one cause of uh, HCC in the uh, United States and North America, followed by its hepatitis C. And hepatitis B is less common of an etiology of uh, uh, cirrhosis and liver cancer here in North America. In Southern uh, Latin America, kind of is similar in the distribution of ideologies with alcohol being the most common, followed by hepatitis C, and hepatitis B is less commonly seen in, North, in South America. Um, certain studies have used future forecasting models to predict that the incidence of hepatic cellular carcinoma is on the rise and will continue to rise in next coming years. It is noted in this study uh, from U.S. and incidence has tripled in the past three decades from the data from the United States. And HCC is unfortunately noticed and is occurring more in um, younger age. And it is seen in both men and uh, women and on all the races. Hispanic and African race appears to be more affected. So by 2030, we anticipate that the incidence of new diagnosis of HCC in both males and female will increase by 43%. Um, with a five-year survival of uh, only 18% in liver cancer, and the liver cancer becomes the second most lethal cancer after pancreatic cancer. And the, the, despite the advances in the management of HCC in the United States, the mortality rate from liver cancer is increasing and is expected to increase further. Um, and this increase is strikingly different when compared to the mortality trends from the other malignancies as shown in this graph, 
which compiles data from United States. And if you see, while mortality rate seems to be decreasing in many other forms of cancers, but liver and it is on the rise. And despite all our advances in, uh, in the management of HCC. So this brings us to the first the summary for the first part of this talk. There is global prevalence of HCC with different, differing etiologies. The number of new cases of HCC are increasing over time in United States also. And despite recent medical advances, the mortality related to HCC is high and is on the rise. All right, so what can we do about it? And are there any strategies to reduce the disease or HCC burden here? So first we need to understand a little bit of pathogenesis of uh, HCC. The patients with chronic liver disease have sustained hepatic inflammation, fibrosis, and then lead, that leads to aberrant uh, hepatocyte regeneration. These abnormalities cause over time excessive fibrosis and, uh, and development of cirrhosis. And ongoing liver injury and regeneration and fibrosis all favor a series of genetic and epigenetic events that culminate in the formation of dysplastic nodules, which are in essence a pre-neoplastic lesion. And within these dysplastic nodules, additional molecular alterations uh, develop that provide these dysplastic cells um, proliferative, invasive, and survival advantage, and complete, and then that completes the transition of uh, dysplastic nodule to a full-blown hepatocellular carcinoma. There are several mutations which have been detected, uh, which could have uh, play a role in this malignant transformation of dysplastic nodules. One mutations in TR, T E R T TERT. Um, uh, uh, a promoter is the most frequent genetic alteration, which is seen in the dysplastic nodules becoming cancers. Um, and this is the mutation which actually is a promoter. Uh, uh, region where hepatitis B can incorporate into the DNA and cause malignant potential of the dysplastic nodule. Um, so we have certain, we have done, made some advances in finding some genetic uh, targets for these to develop some uh, therapies to treat the hepatocellular carcinoma, but you will be surprised to know that hepatocellular carcinoma is among the with the fewest somatic mutations that can be targeted with molecular therapies. And honestly, so far, no mutation is used in clinical practice to predict the therapeutic response. So we are working towards developing and understanding hepatocellular carcinoma. But till that time, can we do anything to decrease the burden of uh, development of HCC? So one of the best evidence and first evidence that HCC risk can be reduced and the associated mortality can be reduced, uh, this came from this landmark study from Taiwan. This was a population-based study in Taiwan in which they basically followed the people who uh, follow the people uh, before they implemented global uh, vaccination in their country. So they saw the, the, the birth cohort, both in males and females, uh, males here and females here, uh, before they got vaccination, the hepatitis B related chronic liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma in this in, in, uh, incidence was really high. But as, when they followed the birth cohort after they implemented global vaccination, that remarkably reduced the incidence of chronic liver disease from hepatitis B, reduced the hepatocellular carcinoma incidence, and, um, and thus the mortality more than 80 to 90 percent. And that really brought to the, uh, to the world knowledge that vaccination definitely can prevent cancer and improve the survival in, uh, in a population based on also. Um, now, but still, despite vaccination, there are several people who have hepatitis B, and uh, hepatitis B treatment is shown to reduce HCC incidence, and this is shown in the most recent retrospective study about, this is 6,900 uh, patients that they had, and this is a, a, this, I selected this study. There are many studies which have shown hepatitis B treatment reduces the HCC incidence. I picked this one because it's more recent, and it's from various uh, U.S. Uh, centers in which they followed the people who have hepatitis B mono infection, and it was shown that among, not only among cirrhotics, but also non cirrhotic So these are uh, non cirrhotics and these are cirrhotics. And if we treat their hepatitis B and we keep the hepatitis B viral, virus suppressed with a tenofovir or entecovir therapy, this study was done on tenofovir, and follow them long enough, this, follow, this study has eight-year follow-up, and they show remarkable 
reduction, significant tick reduction in incidence of HTC and diagnose new diagnosis of HTC. It does not eradicate the risk. That's another important point. We still see some cancers, both in serotics and non serotics but it definitely remarkably reduces the incidence of HTC. Now, um, with hepatitis C also, now we have mounting evidence that treatment of uh, hepatitis C um, infection and achieving sustained biological response, uh, either with interferon or with the newer therapies, reduces the risk of uh, liver cancer uh, tremendously, both in serotics and non serotics This is a combined compiled data from one of the meta-analyses in which they combined all people from whatever, either interferon or DAAs, they got cured from hepatitis C, and they achieved SVR. In serotics, it improved by more than half, and in non serotics almost uh, near zero um, in risk of uh, liver cancer. And this was has a pretty long follow-up in cumulatively of the patients. Uh, so this gives a pretty good, uh, reasonable understanding that liver cancer risk uh, is reduced if we cure hepatitis C patients. Um, let's see. So there are some lifestyle modifications which are interesting and evaluated in various studies. And, um, this interesting study uh, looked at caffeine or coffee intake and um, its impact on the incidence of HCC. Um, this was a meta-analysis from a large cohort study for over 3,000 patients of HCC cases as compared with the population of over, I think, 20,000. Um, and they were able to see some incremental beneficial effects in reducing HCC with the coffee intake. And um, two extra cups of coffee per day was associated with 35% reduction in the risk of HCC. Um, so there was an incremental inc uh, benefit of uh, regarding protection from HCC regardless of underlying liver disease. Uh, however, due to the lack of randomized controlled trials, there, there's definitely these kind of retrospective studies have a potential of uh, bias. There is uh, uh, no accepted definition what coffee is, what is the quantity of coffee. This is just the surveys and uh, retrospective studies. But it's an interesting finding that uh, in increasing the caffeine intake by two cups will decrease the risk of development of HCC down the road. Um, uh, Another study I picked up uh, in regards to lifestyle changes is a physical activity, and this was a large study. They had about uh, um, over 300,000 uh, patients from the NIH AARP diet and health cohort study with a long follow-up over their lifetime. They collected their data and looked at their amount of physical activity they did during their lifetime. So cumulatively, they saw if a person had a persistent good activity of uh, more than seven days of physical activity per week, or basically every day in a week, will have a protective effect in down the road in uh, regarding uh, development of HCC. Um, Interesting thing was that while higher activity showed a trend towards decreased risk, it was actually the sustained physical activity, which was uh, shown to be associated with lower risk of bad color carcinoma. So those people who did not do any physical activity earlier in their life and they increased their physical activity later in their life may not yield the same benefit. Uh, but again, these are associative studies. We have to look at this data with a grain of salt. But at least there is some association of healthy lifestyle and activity possibly by reducing the risk of infertility liver disease and thus reducing the incidence of HCC. Um, another um, Swedish, this study came from Sweden. This was a population-based study. They have a national health database, so they can look at everybody's medication use and health and record. So this nationwide viral hepatitis cohort, which they picked up, they had hepatitis C and viral cohort. They followed them long enough, and they saw those people who were taking statins and specifically more uh, lipophilic statins, which are uh, the atorvastatin, novastatin, simvastatin, are more lipophilic statins. Uh, those people who con took, they had the history of taking statins in their lifetime, when they followed them long enough, they saw that HCC incidence was shown to be decreased, specifically. It wasn't seen in hydrophilic statins. No real, no real explanation why does it happen, but at least lipophilic statins are more lipid uh, absorbed and they do have more hepatotoxicity potential, but uh, at least some association that statin use may 
be beneficial down the road in development of HCC and this retrospective nationwide study of viral hepatitis patients. So, um, so gathering all this data so far in the second portion of this talk, we will see that cirrhosis is a major risk of HCC occurrence and uh, prevention of cirrhosis has the most impo impact on reducing HCC. Um, vaccination against hepatitis B reduced, has shown to reduce liver cancer and related mortality. Um, treatment of viral hepatitis reduces the risk of HCC. This is seen in DAAs with the DAAs and interferon-based therapy for both hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And then there is growing evidence that lifestyle modifications may have a role in reducing HCC incidence. And hopefully this will become more important as we are all facing the fatty liver disease epidemic in our day and uh, our lifetime. Um, so moving on to the third point that I wanted to discuss today is uh, screening or surveillance of HCC. What is the rationale, who to screen, who not to screen, how to screen. So, so screening basically is looking for a disease uh, in case of HCC, looking for HCC in those patients who do not have any known liver lesion and they have some kind of a chronic liver disease or cirrhosis. So uh, there is a rationale, yes, we should screen uh, people with uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's, hepatocellular carcinoma, as we know, it's rare among patients without liver disease, uh, but it is twice as common in men in, as compared to women. Cirrhosis from any cause increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma by annual incidence of 2 to 4 percent. So. Um, so uh, there's a universal understanding that the surveillance pro program will be beneficial if uh, there is uh, more than um, 1.5 to 2 uh, life year gained per percent year if we implement a program. And, and we see that with any form of cirrhosis, there is about 1.5 or even more risk, annual risk of liver cancer, and there is a definitely benefit of screening anybody who has liver sources from any cause. Um, those people, there are certain groups which have known to be, bene uh, known to have be benefit, uh, benefiting from screening, implementing the screening protocol for HCCs are the people who have chronic hepatitis B, no matter what stage, are the active or inactive state, uh, males, Asian males above uh, less than, uh, sorry, um, Asian males above 40, Asian females above 50, uh, anybody who has a family history of liver cancer, African, or even this new, brand new guidelines from 2018 have actually added North African also, blacks with uh, hepatitis B, and uh, it's definitely benefit of screening them for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, the surveillance benefit is uncertain in those people who are not um, Asian males or females who are not above these ages. Uh, hepatitis C with advanced liver disease but not cirrhosis, fatty liver disease without cirrhosis. It is un unclear at this time whether screening them would benefit them, but uh, I think in practical uh, purposes, a lot of people do get screened for HCC. Um, but there, I forgot to mention one thing is that there are certain cases where we may not need to screen them. For example, a person who has advanced liver cirrhosis and child PUC, Okay, if, where, and they're not, uh, not a uh, transplant candidate or not a candidate for any curative therapy, they are so sick from other comorbidities, then those are the patients we may not need to screen them because why do we need to find HCC when we don't, can't do anything about them? And the anticipated survival may be less driven by their own liver disease or comorbidity than finding a new HCC in them. Um, how to screen uh, currently ultrasound with or without AFP every six months in the standard uh, recommendation uh, method for surveillance of HCC. Um, so this means a patient who has chronic liver disease or uh, cirrhosis mainly and uh, who does not have a known liver lesion should be getting ultrasound with or without AFP. Um, there are actually no studies that directly compare ultrasound alone and the combination of ultrasound and AFP, which one, which strategy is superior um, but uh, uh, it is known that if we combine these two therapies in the retrospective and uh, case cohort studies, that this combination was superior in terms of finding cancers at early stage, and thus we can provide them curative therapies. 
Uh, AFP cutoff used in most of the studies and clinical practice is 20. AFP alone should not be used for surveillance. Um, so again, the, the criticism of using AFP alone for surveillance is that, you know, it will be positive, it can be positive in people who have active hepatitis, mainly hepatitis C or fat liver disease, the numbers might be higher than this cutoff, and that will lead to additional unnecessary testing, interventions, even biopsies, and anxiety among the patients and the providers and because there will be some false positive results. So alone should not be used. A ultrasound along with AFP should be uh, a good choice. Ultrasound alone can be used also. But there are challenges if we just use ultrasound alone. So that's the one thing that we should remember. Because, you know, um, it can be ultrasound can be problematic in obese patients. You know, their performance is not that good. And if an ultrasound is being done at some community place where the, the technician or the radiologist is not very familiar with reading and picking up small abnormalities, so that's, that's a situation when we should add IFP also just in, to increase the surveillance uh, um, effective, effectiveness. Uh, ultrasound is limited in picking up infiltrative HCC. It's operator dependent, as we, as we talked about. Um, but the question is, can we, should we use CT or MRI on that situation? No, because the role of CT or MRI as a surveillance tool is unknown at this time, and it's definitely expensive and more burdensome to use, AF, uh, to use on the base, uh, population-based uh, strategies. Um, so, but still, we are educating ourselves, we are telling each other how that we should screen everybody, but still the HCC surveillance is less when we look at the, our uh, uh, paper, hepatitis C or uh, chronic liver disease population. This study I included in the topic because it was a nice uh, oral lab presentation from this past liver meeting in which they looked into why people may not get HCC surveillance and financial burden is important also. That's uh, um, this, this study, which had about 1,000 patients, noted that 61% received surveillance and about 40% did not receive any surveillance screening, despite knowing that they have advanced liver disease or they have cirrhosis. Um, uh, the barriers were uh, basically include cost of testing, difficulty with scheduling this process, uncertainty where to complete an ultrasound, transportation difficulty. So these are all very important things that we need to look into when we are ordering the scans to follow up these people for in the surveillance protocol. So uh, in regards to summary for this portion of screening and surveillance, uh, SCC meets the criteria for the development of a surveillance program, given that the patients with cirrhosis are, are a high-risk group and can be readily identified. And then if we can identify them by either using ultrasound alone or in the combination of ultrasound with the uh, AFP that leads to greater improvement in survival because we are picking up cancers early and we can provide them curative therapy if we find them early. Uh, we need to remember that if we are using ultrasound alone, then operator dependency and reliability of ultrasound performance is an important thing, and especially in those populations which are obese, and, and uh, we should know our center's uh, efficiency and um, experience with using an ultrasound in those populations. That's why we should add uh, AFP in, uh, with ultrasound in, uh, in these kind of patients. All right, so once now the diagnosis. So once we have an abnormal liver lesion, and, and how do we know that it is a cancer, HCC, or not an HCC? So we will, uh, in the next few slides, we'll talk about what can we do, what's the protocol, what images are available, and biop should biopsy be done. Um, so this, paper, this uh, algorithm I took from the paper, which basically describes the algorithm which is uh, suggested by the European Association, but ASLD is not that much different. So, um, so they say that, let's think about, start from here. If a person is, has a nodule identified on a screening ultrasound, which is less than a centimeter, you know, we don't need, we can just do, repeat the ultrasound again in three to four months. And, um, and if there is any growth or any change, then we should go ahead and start a, a, do a baseline uh, uh, cross-sectional imaging based either with CT scan or MRI. If it is stable, then we may follow it 
This is for a lesion which is identified on a screening uh, test which is less than a centimeter. Anything which is above centimeter, you know, we should definitely go ahead and do a um, cross-sectional study, either a CT scan or MRI. It has to be a multiphasic or what we call triple-phase scan, because in the next slides I'll show you why it is important. But if, because that can reliably confirm HCC in a in, in a lesion which is more than a centimeter, and we have several very specific criteria to diagnose HCC based on radiology. And we can we do not need a biopsy at that in most of the lesions. But if there is a not clear answer in one scan, then another scan can be repeated. If a CT scan was done, an MRI can be repeated. An MRI was done, CT scan can be repeated to to re re uh, evaluate that lesion. And if we find that we get an answer, then we it is an HCC. Do not need to do biopsy. And if we still do not have an answer in a lesion which is above a centimeter or near two centimeter, biopsy can be done. Um, so, uh, why multiphasic scan is important in uh, diagnosis of HCC? The reason is the vascular shift that occurs during the malignant transformation of hepatocytes are basic, basically uh, are the basis why we use multiphase scan in diagnosis of HCC. Benign lesions, which are regenerative or dysplastic nodules, are supplied by the branches of portal system, whereas the malignant nodules are supplied by the hepatic artery. So a lesion which will show as a little darker le uh, uh, spot on a non-contrast scan, if it is an HCC, because HCC grows on arterial blood supply and from hepatic artery, in the arterial phase it will light up. It will be called enhancement or hyper-enhancement or early enhancement in the arterial phase. And as we are waiting for the venous, the portal venous phase to come out in the second subsequent scans, this lesion will drain all the contrast through their venous. So that will start becoming dark. And rest of the liver, which is mainly supplied by portal veins, will start lighting up and becoming bright with the contrast. So this is called early enhancement and rapid wash out. This is classic finding for hepatocellular carcinoma. And that's why we do multiphasic scan to, and if, somebody, if a lesion has arterial enhancement and portal venous and delayed wash out, that is confirmatory for hepatocellular carcinoma. It's seen here in, uh, um, in this uh, MRI report, MRI images. The sh so this shift translates to distinctive pattern of hyperenhancement here. So you'll see arterially it is enhancing. Uh, why it is arterial? Because aorta is lit up also. So aorta is lit up, lesion is lit up. This is arterial phase. And by the time rest of the liver lights up with a portal vein, which is this one, this becomes dark. So this is a classic uh, um, uh, arterial enhancement and venous washout, which is classic for HCC. And this is all put together in this LIRAD classification, which is liver imaging reported and data system classification, which categorizes based on the findings of enhancement and washout and tumor growth into different categories. And the categories that we look for is LR5, and these categories basically give us the, how, what is the likelihood of, have present, uh, of, uh, of the cancer to be present in the lesion that we are looking at. So if LR5 means that it is very likely that they have HCC um, and subsequently lesser probability of developing cancer if the categories are lower down. LR3s are, we are the case lesions which we do not know. They are not high, high probability for HCC. So, uh, so so this is all nicely characterized, and most of the radiologists are very familiar with it, and the radiologists should be reading a liver lesion on a multiphase scan based on the LIRAD criteria. So uh, another question that comes up very frequently um, uh, is the CT batter or an MRI batter. Um, so um, currently, ASLD recommends the diagnostic evaluation of for HCC with either a multiphasic CT scan or multiphasic MRI because they're both kind of similar in uh, their diagnostic performances. The selection of optimal modality should be individualized that it depends on multiple factors beyond the diagnostic, beyond their own ability to diagnose. There are so many other things that we need to look into. These include uh, availability of MRI or a CT scan, how much center experience is is there with uh, reading an MRI, for example, scheduling, patient's cooperation, the other health condition, examination cost, 
radiologist who's going to read it, th their expertise in reading an MRI. So, so although multiphasic MRI may be marginally more sensitive than CT scan in a pooled analysis for comparative studies, but, uh, but there's all studies were done in all academic centers. So uh, generalizability of using an MRI as a first modality may not be practical in uh, non-academic or uh, community-based places. So CT and MRI, as long as any one of the scans done in a good place where a person who knows how to read it, and um, is, is any both of them are equally good. Um, there's a new uh, modality that is being available, and it's it's available in Europe, but some of the centers in the United States, which is called contrast in enhanced ultrasonography. It's kind of a multi-phase ultrasound in which we give a contrast and we look at in real time the, if the lesion is lighting up in the arterial phase. Uh, it's being still being under investigation in the United States. It will be something to look forward to. Um, another cost question that really often comes up whether we should do a biopsy for diagnosis of HCC. Uh, so any liver region which is classic LR5 should not be biopsy that we discussed early, which has a classic enhancement and when we wash out, it is very high likely that HCC does not need a biopsy. But if a liver mass whose appearance is not typical for HCC on the contrast enhanced imaging, especially for the, uh, the those are which are characterized at LR4 or LRM, if they are large, if, if large enough size, then when we can do the biopsy, we should do a biopsy. Um, ASLD suggests against routine biopsy for every inter, in, indeterminate nodule. So we should not be doing biopsy on any nodule which is in, uh, indeterminate, so we should follow them in, with the imaging for now. Again, because biopsy has its own risk, its own risk of bleeding, tumor seeding, uh, possibility that the negative biopsy, the you did a biopsy of a liver lesion, but it was not in the lesion and it came out negative, and then we thought this person doesn't have a cancer. Uh, so all these things are real, real uh, logistics issues and uh, real important practical issues. So, so that's why biopsy should not be deterred done on every in indeterminate nodule. Only those who are large enough have a characteristic of LRM and LR4. And the biopsy diagnosis will, will, be, will help the patient in, in, in further management. Um, there are more advances in bio, like biopsy. There are certain uh, tumor histological markers which are being available, which increases our uh, likelihood of finding HCC uh, as compared to non-HCC nodules, but again, still under investigation. Um, so till those are available, we may not need to do biopsy. So, so summary for this portion of talk would be that uh, suspicion, suspicious lesions under a centimeter seen on a screening ultrasound can be closely followed. So we can start with to follow up with them with an ultrasound every three to four months or every six months. And if there is any change, then we should go ahead and do a multi-phase scan. Um, diagnosis of HCC can reliably be made without need, need, needing a biopsy, which should be reserved only for indeterminate lesions of two multiphasic studies. And new approaches are being investigated to enhance diagnosis of HCC at early stages. So that's all the focus is, because that will be that is the only way we will uh, provide them the curative treatments and thus improve the survival with HCC. Just the last one or two slides. Just these are um, some few words on staging of HCC. This will this portion of the talk will serve as a template for the treatment options, which will be discussed in the later sessions in this uh, webinar series. Um, so, as we know that HCC all, almost always develop in the background of liver cirrhosis. So the patient with liver cirrhosis all, uh, often have poor health status. So it is, HCC is not a single, a separate disease. It, we have to look at HCC in the background of liver cirrhosis and the um, complications of liver cirrhosis and their overall health. Uh, so. Uh, so to, to adequately uh, estimate uh, survival, a staging system must quantify not only the tumor burden, but also the extent of liver dysfunction and performance status, which was all, uh, these all components were all put together and are measured in this uh, staging algorithm, which is called BCLC, Barcelona Clinic Liver Cancer Algorithm, which was originally introduced in 1999, and it is the staging system most widely applied, and most of the societies and uh, centers uh, follow this algorithm. The al this algorithm classifies patients as being one of the five stages, zero, A, B, C, D, um, 
and provides treatment recommendations for each stage. Each stage has a defined mortality also associated. So those with stage zero and A have more than five years and subsequent higher stages will have lesser survival. Um, the stages uh, look into the tumor burden as quantified um, by, uh, by the number and size of nodules seen on a CT scan. In addition, if there is micro macrovascular invasion present or metastasis present. Uh, for the assessment of liver function, we so far are using uh, child few score mostly, uh, but also MEL score is utilized, presence of portal hypertension is utilized, because all these factors are important in discussing the next treatment options. And uh, overall patient's performance status is important, ECOG 0 to ECOG 1 to 2 in, uh, in uh, advanced state HCC. So the complexity in management of HCC is, you know, uh, it is complex, but so we need to as accurately stage them and look at not only just the tumor burden, but also their liver status and, and overall health status. So it becomes a really difficult decision what should be the treatment options for these patients. So that's why it is best served with a multidisciplinary team, team approach with expertise in hepatology, hepatobiliary surgery, pathology, oncology, and radiology all together, sitting together and reviewing each patient on individualized basis. Um, it actually, the multidisciplinary team approach towards management of HCC has become the standard of care for HCC management. HCC should not, the management plan for HCC should not be ideally made by one person who is seeing the patient at one time. Should be brought to the team and all the options should be evalu evaluated for each and every patient to see which was the best one for that person. All right, so this brings us to a final summary slide. Um, I think we are in good time. Um, so summary would be that despite advancement in the management of HCC, the mortality rates from HCC are rising. Increased awareness is needed regarding identification of at-risk population and initiation of surveillance programs, as any surveillance program will help us early identification of HCC and at security stages, and thus we will be able to improve survival. Diagnosis and management of HCC requires a multidisciplinary approach. I think that's all from my me, and I will see if we have some questions and we have good enough time to discuss them. Okay, so we did not receive any questions through the chat, but at this time, I would like to um, go ahead and welcome anyone who is viewing to share any questions that they have, and we would be happy to answer those. And if there are no further questions, um, I would like to thank you all for attending. We greatly appreciate it. And I will be sharing the link again with our upcoming programs and then also um, a link to a recording of this presentation.